Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the TS4 webinar series, proudly brought to you by the Sydney Southeast Asia Center, the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies, and the New York Southeast Asia Network. My name is Sawani Alexander from Ubon Ratchathani University, Thailand. I'm your host today, and in this session, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Tanate Risaizon from the Faculty of Political Science, Ubon Ratchathani University. Good afternoon, Tanate. If he's unmuted. Hello, good afternoon. So, Sorry. Uh, very I, I good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tanache has three masters from three different universities, one in translation from Jilalongkorn University, Thailand, and the other two in international relations, one from Thomasat University, Thailand, and the other from Durham University, the UK. And he just received his PhD in international relations uh, from Loughborough University. Uh, you can see his full bio on the TS4 website. Today, Tanache is going to spend about 20 minutes on his talk entitled Language Choice as a Political Tool. And then we save the rest of our time for um, until 3 p.m. So we, we basically have one hour uh, on Q&A. So Tanache, are you ready? Yes, I'm, okay, I can't then. wait to talk to everyone. So first of all, I have to say hello to the audience, to everyone here. And the topic of my presentation today is title language choice as a political tool. And first of all, I would like to share about the background of this presentation. And the information of this presentation is from my field work on my PhD dissertation and still that information has been dragged on after I graduated from the UK. And during my PhD time and still now, I have the Thai Lao Mekong border as the field work and major field work. And I have been engaging with people in the field. So working with them, I have seen, I have observed the patterns of language and political communication in that area. And therefore I have some observation to talk about about it today with everyone. So the today's discussion actually uh, is a self-introduction of myself and, and you know, uh, uh, Dr. Saudi Alexander ha has talked about myself a little bit and maybe I will talk a little bit more about maybe my, not my education background, but my work, my publication a little bit because it's related to the topic today. And the next topic is about the research question of this topic of presentation. And then I will talk about the research setting. I will take you to where I have been working. And lastly, of, this, uh, of the last part of my presentation today is about the theoretical reflection and some of the theoretical discussion and conclusion for today. Um, yeah. Dr. Alexander has talked about me already. So this is about my university. It's in Ubalotitani in Thailand. And Dr. Alexander and, and I have been working here for decades, maybe 10 years, no, 30 years. So the, it's part of my PhD dissertation. And, and actually the PhD presentation is about the everyday border crossing in the Thai Lao border. That's the main topic for my PhD presentation. But the discussion today is not about the everyday crossing, it's about the language choice. So it's a little bit different, but the data acquisition is from the same source. I will talk about the selection of Lao dialects of the undocumented Lao laborers in Ubalatatani and you know the choice it affects a lot about the trust building and trust building, if anthropologists will know that trust building is important source when, whenever we enter the field. And I will talk about this later. Yeah, I talk about myself now, yeah, because of this Thai Lao border is uh, my field work. And I have published two books already. If you interested or you want to find out more, you can, you can buy my books 
in the future, the, the, the left one uh, I published with Paul Graf Macmillan is about uh, the field work I have been conducting research. It's the riverine border practice in the Thai Lao border and everyday border crossing. And, and it was published last year. On the right hand side is space and time on Thai Lao relations. This is mainly international relations theory. And I will focus more on the borderlands. It will be launched next month, no, in June, in two months' time. So, yeah, the two books maybe more or less is about the topic today. Okay, let's get back to the topic today. I entered the field of the Thai Lao border as anthropologist. And we know that anthropologists, we have to be with the people. And sometimes, but sometimes, most of the time, class or positionality and gender affects data acquisition a great deal. For example, if I want to look for the ways in which the undocumented laborers or stateless people cross the border from Lao Sai to Thailand, I have to be with them. I have to talk to them. And everyone knows that if we just go straight to ask them question, hello, can you give me information? How many times you cross the border and, and are you illegal or are you illegal? Of course, they won't give you an answer easily. They will be suspicious. Why this guy is coming to ask me question? Is this guy, is this lad a police officer? Is he a spy? So I have been thinking what to do to gather the information. And I, before I enter the field, I could find two ways to build trust. The first strategy is that I will volunteer to the community to be an English teacher. I taught, of course, I taught the children in the area English. And in the Thai Lao context, if you are a teacher, no one wants to be suspicious about your intention. And that's one step of trust building. And the second strategy I used, I decided to use the accent, the Lao accent and the Isan accent to change the accent. That's my, that, that was my speculation because, you know, Isan and Lao People Democratic Republic, which is the Lao state, we shared similar language. And if you look at the history, it was even claimed to be one ancient state, the same Lan Sang state before the, the modern state of Siam and Thailand was established. You know, and so I decided that if whenever I encounter the Lao docu undocumented laborer, I would change my accent. I would not use Isan accent. I would use Vientiane dialect, which is the capital city and, and the official language of Lao to make, because I decided that these two strategies would be fundamental to, to build trust with me, you know, because when, when the undocumented laborer, they saw me, they thought, oh, this guy is from the middle class. So he might want something. I won't give him information easily. So yes, first being a teacher, second, change the language. And if you ask the question, the research question asks that, is it effective? My hypothesis is that it would be effective. But I mean, I found out the answer was that, yeah, being a teacher was, was very effective. You know, nobody wants to, to question my, my intention when I ask the children, how many times you cross the border illegally? How many times you just cross the border without having to resort to any, any immigration? The school, school students gave me an answer in, the, uh, in an essay writing because I was a teacher. They didn't ask me questions, they didn't ask, oh, why would the teacher ask me this question? So the school children, they weren't suspicious about being a teacher. So the first strategy was working very well. However, the second one somehow backfires because you know, after I finished school, the school ended in Thailand, school ended at four in, in the afternoon. And Kong Tiam, but in the area, it was the area where, where red light district and you know, somewhat undocumented laborer was 
a lot of them were engaged with human trafficking in the area. And when I went to the place where human trafficking was accused of, a lot of people were, did not trust me. You know, I have to show you this, this map first. This is, a, this is the map of Thailand and Lao PDR. And, you know, somehow the area I was, I was working is number five over here. If you see the river Mekong, the Mekong River, it borders Thailand, the length is uh, 1,810 kilometers. That's, that's, that's the whole length, but the Mekong is only 1,108 of the river. It means that the river is not always the border. Sometimes it's the overland and Ubalachatan is the province that has two, these two characters. In the northeast of Ubalachatani, it was the riverine border, but below Kongtiam is the overland border. That's why we, we, we heard the news that people crossed the border and collect mushroom and, and were arrested because it was not it was not the river. It was Chongmek, it was the overland. So I decided to, to go this area, which is the, the conjunction of the riverine and the land border. So this is the this is the place where I was working in since. 2016 to from 2017, but up to now, before the COVID-19. But after COVID-19, I just withdrew from the area already. But yeah, I've talked, I'm talking in, uh, about the past information. So this is the area over here, I was working. And this area, you know, if, if you see, if you see, if you look at the map, of course, um, if you look at many research, there has been, it has been proved that the transnationality of the people, the flow of the people to look for jobs, for their better economic jobs, it, they usually come from the less or the slower economic rapid, for example, from Lao PDR to look for a job in Thailand because there is more job opportunities. And of course, a lot of people cross the border, a lot of people from Lao PDR cross the border to look for a job in Thailand. Um, of course, there has been research in Nong Thai, um, in Mukdahan, in Nakhon Phnom. A lot of people from Lao PDR crossed the border to look for a job in Thailand. And in Kong Tiam as well, a lot of people from Lao PDR look for a job in Thailand. And, and yeah, sometimes it's not only along the, the border cities of Lao, sometimes it can be deeper. For example, I, I talked to one girl from Park Song, um, she used to work in, in the coffee plantation because it was too little paid. So she decided to cross the border in Chongmik, which is in the Southern Lao, but that's not surprising. What surprises me, you know, Hong Tiam is here, Chongmik is here. If Lao people in the South, which speak language in Southern dialect and similar to Sisuke accent, and what accent crossed the border, that's not surprising. But if you walk along the market of Kong Tiam, you hear the accent of people from Udom Sai around here. Luang Prabang accent can be found in, 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 uh, in the market of, of Kong Tiam and Vientiane as well. That's in the market in daytime. And at nighttime, I, as a teacher, Go to the karaoke bar in Thai Lao context. If you go to karaoke bar, that's a sexual connotation. But I'm not sure if Western, in the Western sense, you might have some difficulty to understand why karaoke is linked with sexual connotation. But in, in the Thai Lao context, you know, there's a there's a prostitution hidden in that. And I, I, I collected the confirmation in, in the karaoke bar and I could hear uh Vincen accent. From the girls, I could hear Long Hoa accent. Sometimes, Sip Song Panai accent is heard here. It's very surprising. And but it's it's very rare. But Vien Tian and, and Long Hoa was common. But at one time, I heard I heard like Thai Yai, no Thai Lu accent. And I I asked the the lady for line account, and she didn't have line account. She had WeChat, which is Chinese application for chat. 
you know, it means that it could be assumed that she's from somewhere else in the, in, in, the, in the north, you know, and but but these people they didn't stay they didn't stay for three days after the third days they disappear I don't know where where disappear to okay anyway the point is that the accent of the people who cross the border is not does not have to be from the south it's from the north very often and that's why it 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 matches in and, and it it comes with my research question today if it works or not that I change the accent. Of course, I did change the accent. I try to speak like a Vientian. But first of all, I'm from Oborajatani, you know, as the same as Dr. Saudi Alexander is the same, same hometown. And, and we know what accent of Ubon people is like. And, you know, I grew up with this kind of accent. And I practiced, I've been practiced for years to speak like, like a Vientian person. And I'm, sh I'm pretty sure, I'm very sure that it works because when I went to a, to Vientian, you know, Lao, in Lao PDR is similar to Bangkok. They, when they collect tickets, Lao people pay, pay the price of the Lao people and foreigners pay higher price. It's the same as in Bangkok. And when I went to uh, Wat Si Sakit and Ho Pakel, you know, the, 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 the place for Emerald Buddha, I, I was charged in the same price as Lao people because, you know, it could be assumed that I speak like a Vientian person. And they asked me if I was called Lao, if I was a Lao, a Lao citizen, I said, yes, I am. <laughs> so so I, I, I could enter, you know, I, I was just to, to try if my accent was working and it, it was working at that time in Vientian. And at that time in Kong Jiam as well, when I spoke with the lady who claimed to be from Vientian, I spoke with Vientian accent, hoping that she would trust me fast. She would trust me easily, but it turned out that she was suspicious even more. And, you know, I asked why, why I kept asking myself, why would not she trust me easily? And yeah, and I could find out the answer that because these people thought that normally the customers who came, who visit the karaoke bar would be from the local government people or the school, local school teachers. And of course they speak like an Ubon. And they would expect people who, who, who speak like that. But when someone who speaks, at, at first I spoke, when I, I entered the field, I entered the, the karaoke bar, I spoke in Ubon accent. And then I changed the accent to Vientian, to Vientian accent and the ladies were suspicious. How come this guy changed the accent? And later when, when she trusts and, and when we, we, we got closer, she said that at first they thought I was someone sent from Vientian government to detect for illegal laborers or undocumented laborers. Actually it was everywhere undocumented laborers, but it was not usual for someone to speak the accent of the Vientian accent to in, in Chongmik, in Uwarshitani. So in conclusion, you know, the informants was more suspicious of my intention for that case. And that happened three or four years ago. And I'm sure if I go to the field again and I, I encounter any, any person from Vientian who come to work in the in the Thai Lao border in the southern stone, they would still be suspicious if I change the accent. So I would suggest that if you want to build trust, be yourself. <laughs> Don't try to speak another accent. It doesn't help. It doesn't help in this case, it's especially is in the job that which is, you know, you you can see any border, you know, something which is associated with human trafficking, something which is uh, associated with a uh, illegal illegality just be yourself don't try to to speak something which is far away that backfires indeed and that's the conclusion regarding to the positionality of the of the person who who want to be in the field who want to establish trust with the informants who are marginalized people and cross the border to find jobs in thailand thank you Thank you very much. 
Very interesting. Now we are taking questions. So anybody in the audience can drop in their questions in the um, QA box. And in the meantime, I have my own questions because I'm a linguist, right? And I'm always interested in uh, studying sensitive issues, especially politics. And this is not strictly politics, you know, but, uh, you know, as I said many times on many occasions that, you know, everything around us is political. Now, first things, yes, we, as a researcher, we always want to have trust by our participants, especially when we rely on, you know, field research and, you know, observing, interviewing, blending in with the people, you know, um, and again, we try our best, you know, using whatever skills that we have in order to gain the trust. And obviously in this case, you know, when you sound too much like them, they suspect that you are a troublemaker, right? So, uh, but, you know, the first thing that came to my mind as I was, you know, listening to, to this, first things, you have people, you know, potential participants with so many different accents from Laos, and especially from the North, and so did you find an answer as to why there were so many Lao people from the northern part of the country in this part of Thailand? You know, um, why in Kong Tien, why in Ubon? Uh, I will show you the map again. So, so many people from the north, but right. I found them here. <laughs> right. Um, actually, I didn't, find, I didn't find the answer. It's, could only be a guess, just my speculation, because at that time, it was not about my research question, so I didn't pay attention to, to look for the answer. But my speculation is that they could have been really engaged with uh, human trafficking. And when they crossed the border, they, they did not use visa. They didn't use working visa. They didn't use passport. Right. They came as a tourist, and if as a tourist, you could cross the border in a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, and as I said, three days, they disappear. And they, they might change the spot. I just speculate. Maybe they come from Mukdahan three days. Maybe they come to Kenwara three days and meet Kong Tien three days and went back, back, not back, back north again. So are you and suggesting that... Oh, sorry, they might... Um, I, I would not blame them that they are really engaged with that kind of human trafficking, but it's likely. If you look at other research, for example, Sven Molland, uh, 2012, uh, he has been conducting research about human trafficking from, from Vientiane and Nongkai, but that makes sense because Vientiane and Nongkai is just opposite, right? Right. And yeah, and oh, but, but one, one argument is that he said that it comes from the, the fam when the ladies from Laos look for a job, mm -hmm. most of them did not want to do this job, but because of the family, mm -hmm. uh, have connection with the families who's been working in Nong Kai already. So they just send their children to work in Nong Kai. And in the same, in the same time, in the meantime, in Chong Mek, in Kong Jiam, it's a family connection again. That's why mm -hmm. they come. And family and friend, three days, mm -hmm. maybe just friend, family and friend, friend number friends, friend number friend, maybe. I don't know. I didn't find I didn't find the answer why, but surprisingly, a lot of northern dialect from Lao was heard here. Not not to mention the human trafficking stuff in at nighttime, daytime, in the market, sell meat, the different accent. Is heard in the market as well. Um, no answer. The, the answer is no answer. Only speculation mm -hmm. that that I might be wrong. I might be wrong, and I don't want to be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to to really be assertive about it. Only mm -hmm. speculation that yeah, they're really engaged, really engaged with this kind of human trafficking, and they try to to escape from from the authority to arrest them. That's why they change the place all very, the time. Very interesting. 
Very interesting. Now we started having questions coming in. So right now we have four. So let's start with John Clark's question because it's very uh, basic and to the point. And so you can illustrate this point about different accents. So uh, the question uh, reads, could you give some concrete utterances in Isan, you know, uh, you know Lao Isan and, and Lao like Vientian speech? Oh. Like a comparison example, of different, yeah. For example, um, you know, in Isan is like Isan has many has many accents, but in in Ubon is one accent, so I speak Ubon. For example, yeah. um, somebody di bo, somebody di bo, some I, I how are you feeling today? Somebody di bo, but in Laos they wouldn't say somebody, they would say somebody, and somebody doesn't mean how are you doing, it means mm -hmm. hello, which is different. Different meaning, mm -hmm. one different accent, another. Okay, so um, the tone differences are pretty, pretty clear. Thank you very much. Now, um, we have one question from Kun Surya Glangrit, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he says, or she says, I don't know. I have been to Atapu so many times, if I'm not wrong. There's so many accents in the southern parts of Lao PDR. But why uh, the Vientian accent is the best communication tool for trust building for collecting data? Does it because it because I'm not saying I'm not claiming that Vientian is the best, but mm -hmm. I'm claiming that using the accent, which is the same as the accent used by the participant or prospective informant, could be the best. So if they are from somewhere else, if they're from Atapu, I would change to Atapu accent as mm -hmm. well. Or maybe, yeah, in, in Champasak accent, which is somehow is very similar to this again, but not quite. So mm -hmm. it's not about Vientian, it's about the accent, which is spoken by the, the participant. Mm -hmm. So basically you want to accommodate, you know, their yes. language. Choice. I want to be and... like, like where they're from. Yeah. Yeah, we try that. We, you know, a lot of us probably have this experience of, you know, at least, you know, scholars studying Thai politics or Thai studies, you would want to be able at least to, you know, to speak Thai first, Central Thai, and then some other regional languages as well. Yes, yes, yes. So that is that is kind of natural and that's understandable. But the interesting part is that it's kind of backfired a little bit, right? Yes, so thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> okay, so that's the next question from our Duncan McCall cargo here. Um, apart from the question of accent, how did you explain your presence in the field? Did you tell the informants you were a PhD student or a lecturer? Um, I entered the field. Actually, if I resort to the, the ethics, I'm not supposed to tell lies. Mm -hmm. But I went to the field. I introduced myself as a, as a teacher, but I I talked to the director of Kong Tiam Vithyalai School. I said that I was a PhD student, but I volunteered to teach English to, to the school students. And when I talked to the, the villagers that I'm a PhD student and I teach English, they could not understand maybe, they just thought that I'm a teacher. When I, you know, I introduced in Thai, uh, they just think that I'm a teacher. They, they couldn't grasp the idea that I'm a PhD student. So I was, mm. I was known in the community as an English teacher, not a PhD student, even though I tried to tell them that I'm a PhD student, but they just grabbed that I'm a teacher. So the idea of PhD student somehow was deleted, was omitted in the scene, all these school, uh, school English. Some, some people, Knew, knew that I am a PhD student. For example, the, the school teachers at school and my major informant who is stateless. He is a stateless, this family is stateless family, but they knew that I, I was a PhD student because I, I was sleeping in the, their house. But I don't, I don't know if, if they could, they knew that I'm not a teacher, but I don't know how much they know, how well they know about PhD, but they knew. But about other people, I don't know. Maybe they just knew that I'm an English teacher. Mm. Okay. 
So they, they basically identify you however they would like to identify you. Yes, English teacher, just that. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to understand. That's totally understandable. Now we have another question from uh, Kunmarty Nielsen. Um, I'm just going to read it because, you know, just to honor the, the person, you know, writing the, the yes. comments and questions. Thank you, Ajahn Tanate. Really fascinating and interesting insights from the field. I have a question regarding research ethics. Were you all the time um, honest about the fact that you were a researcher collecting information for your research, both as a teacher and in the karaoke bars? As an anthropologist, we are always collecting information. So the question about consent and honesty regarding the use of our information is always tricky. What are your reflections regarding informing the people you met about your research? This kind of reminds me of Duncan's yeah. question too. So what yeah. are your reflections? Actually, there was a there was they have to sign a consent form, but hmm. It was not my intention to just go to the first day and hand in the consent form on the first day. I would befriend them first until they knew me well. And I would ask them, if, are you okay? If they are okay to give me information. And if they're okay, I would just hand them the consent form um, about who I am, about what the, 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 the data would be used. But at first, the first two months, I didn't mention about the research, but I yeah I, I say that I was a PhD student and 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 an English teacher, but I I would not tell them that I would come here to collect data. I would just befriend I, I befriend them first until I could see that they they were easy and they were like they felt that there was no harm. I would just start to ask them. So it took time. It's not it was not in the first week or first month at all. But I made sure that every information that was used in, in the PhD dissertation or further research after I graduated was accompanied with the handwritten and signed consent form. Mm -hmm. So I have a follow-up question based on this one. Um, so from the moment you decided to tell them, because you started feeling like some trust, you know, occurred between yes, yes, you yes. And, and the pot potential participants at this point, and you started talking yes. about your actual um, reason for being there in a the community. So um, how long would it normally take for you to kind of, you know, when you, you realize that they could be your potential participant and you start talking about your research, how long after that, you know, did it take you to, to to get consent from them? It really depends. Um, the major participants, it took after three months that I asked um, them to sign. The major participants, um, three months, even though even though they knew they I think they were they were the persons, the, the family members, they were four people in the families and three or four relatives who crossed the border to work illegally from Champasak, from Pakse. So it took me four months or five months, even though they, they knew that I was a PhD. And normally the villagers would not, would not recognize that I was a PhD student. They would say that I'm English teacher, but this family knew well. So it, for this family that I trust the most, four or five months before I handed them the, the, the consent form. And not to, not to speak about the people at the karaoke bars. I didn't ask them. I tried to ask one of them, but he was a, he was a LGBTQ plus owner, mm -hmm. but stateless. Mm -hmm. I asked mm -hmm. him, I asked him, are you okay to talk? Tomorrow, are you okay to talk about uh, your occupation and your cross border crossing activities? And tomorrow, the next day, I would come and ask you to interview you and I will have the document for you to sign. I asked him if he was okay. At first he said he was okay. But the following day, I went to see him and I said, oh, I was busy. Oh, I have to, I have to do that. Could you come tomorrow? And I said, okay, mm -hmm. I come again tomorrow. And the next day I came again and the same answer. 
that happened three times. So I could mm -hmm. see that he was not willing to give me any information. Mm -hmm. But just talk is okay. But if he has to sign anything, he would not do it. He was stateless. Mm -hmm. he, was, he, he didn't have citizenship. And he was from Lao and he was LGBTQ+. Mm -hmm. And that place was, that place was a restaurant, but he used a nominee, he used a nominee to, to, to sign to, you know, some kind of legal docu document to, to be a restaurant. And that place, often, often time, often time, military, military officers and police officers came to visit, to look if there was any undocumented laborers. So I understood him well, that the reason why that he, he wouldn't want to, to, to sign consent form. So that's fine. I understood. And this story was not mentioned in my in my research, but it was okay because uh, if you ask about the accent, about the linguistic stuff, this person uh, speaks Ubon accent. So, but but the the waitress in the restaurant came from Mueang Kong, which is in Lao. I think it's in the area, this area near Park Se Mueang Kong. So the accent was not that much different, a little bit different, but you know you can change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that I can see happening now. Did you notice, since we are talking about accent at this point, you, you see any um, effort on the, the participants' parts, especially women, uh, to try to accommodate the local accent, to try to speak with the Ubon accent instead of maintaining their own, you know, original or, you know, native accent from Northern Laos, for example? Um, I, I was not, I didn't have a chance to speak, to talk or conversation, much con much time to talk about people from the north of Laos mm -hmm. because they mm -hmm. just gone, they've gone only three days, but I was in the family of the people who are from the southern Laos. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. so it, it was not, it was not, there was not much difference between, mm -hmm. yeah, there's some difference, but not much. So it's easy, but some, you know, you don't have to talk about them crossing the border. Even if mm -hmm. you cross the border to this area, you can hear Isan accent. Mm -hmm. This area, in Lao, it lies in Isan accent. Mm -hmm. Maybe they consume Thai television, I don't know. Or maybe they just cross the border to in Thailand and they cross back, mm -hmm. I don't know. But, but, but again... Along the border in the restaurant, you know, it's not the, this time it's not about the accent. It's the mm -hmm. lexicon, it's the lexicon. Right, right, right. For example, a bottle of water in Isan, it was, you say, Nam Kuat Nung, Nam Kuat Nung, but in Laos, Nam Keo Nung. But if a plastic bottle, Nam Tuk Nung, I heard Nam Tuk Nung over here. In Kong Tiam, Nam Tuk Nung. Ajan Alexander, have you ever heard of Nam Tuk Any Anybody speaking Nam Tuk Nung in Ubon Tao? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> plastic bottle. Uh, uh, uh -huh. Very interesting. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much. Now we have another challenging question from Duncan. I think this is a nagging question for a lot of international researchers wanting to study uh, Thailand. So the question reads, do you think for this kind of project, it was essential to be from Isan, Lao Thai. Could a Faran researcher conduct this kind of project successfully, for example, or would informants be too suspicious? Oh, uh, you know, we, we talk about positionality. Um, when you conduct the research, it's not you, only you who interpret the, the informants, but in the informants interpret you as well. So if you don't look, if you don't look similar to them, Maybe it's very, it's very, the, the, the direction could come, could go di different direction. For example, you could not tell, you could not tell the informants that you are Lao or you, even though you speak Lao perfectly, they will not believe that you are Lao, you are from Lao. Mm -hmm. But for me, mm -hmm. if I speak similar to, to the, to Vientian, they, even though I try to tell them that I'm from Uwon, they would believe mm -hmm. that they're from Vientiane, you know, because of the appearance as well. So, so um, positionality matters. This mm -hmm. in this kind of social research, 
social science research. Wow. Um, no, no, I don't think so. So, so well, then it also means that if you look different, like if you look like a Westerner, but speaking loud, well, perfectly, you know, perfectly. the best you can, then, and then they know that you are not from Laos simply because you look different, exactly. and obviously, yeah. So it could be an element of trust because they don't see you as a, as a threat, but you, because you look just like them, so they might suspect that you're from, um, you know, an, an, um, a spy or something simply because, you know, we look the same. So sometimes being looking so different can be a uh, can be a uh, kind of can can be helpful, right? Yes. The look 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 matters. Um, I have another instance. It's not about the. It's not about this time. It's not about in the karaoke bar. But I accompanied my major participant to cross the border illegally to Lao. So I was illegal tourist to Lao. You know, I sat in the boat with my participant from here, deep here, deeper to Lao. And whenever the Lao police came to detect illegal border crossing, it was, it was very risky because if I was arrested, I could be jailed in Lao and I could have mm. to pay, I uh, have had to pay 5,000 US, 5, US dollars, but my major participant is from Pakse. Mm -hmm. He told the Lao policeman that I'm from Vientiane. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. policeman believed him. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I could go to Lao illegally and come back safely. Mm -hmm. So look matters and the accent just is an additional factor. Right. But and imagine I if I was a foreign and I, I sat on a boat and crossed mm -hmm. to Lao illegally. And if the participant uh, told lie to the Lao police officer that oh he's from Vientiane, they wouldn't believe him. Mm -hmm. So the way I dressed, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I dressed like a middle class, and I spoke mm -hmm. Vientiane. That makes mm -hmm. sense. That's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you just have to see when it would work and when it wouldn't. Now, um, I have this question that that I had, um, when you started talking about um some uh, laborers wondering if you were spy a spy from the law government why would they fear being caught or found by the law authorities uh, uh, that time when... it, yeah that time uh the time of my few work from that i started doing the few work, it was it was in 2016. Mm -hmm. but three months before i entered the field three months before i entered the field there was a human trafficking cleanup decided by Bangkok. Military officer oh. came to the field and they just charged the, I think more than 50 karaoke, 54, 52 karaoke bars in the area. Three months before I entered the field. That's why, but you know, some could still escape from that cleanup. So mm -hmm. when I entered the field, they still, they, they, they were suspicious of everyone. Weird, oh, okay. strange, like me. Mm -hmm. Very weird, mm -hmm. indeed. Mm -hmm. And you know, I happen to know to know some the trick that they could escape from the from the from the cleanup. For example, someone could be a mistress of a could have an affair with a na naval military. I don't know. It was mm -hmm. it was said in the village, rumors, and mm -hmm. you know, and strangely, sometimes when the military came for uh, inspection. They just chat the karaoke bars and that Lao ladies that were just friends, to visit friends, they were not working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, now I have another question. <laughs> it's just too many questions. Do you find that being a man uh, can be a problem, can be an obstacle to your own research when it comes to kind of, uh, learning from you know this karaoke workers. Um, it's not. It's being a man has pros and cons. Yeah, pros that mm -hmm. like uh, sometimes they, they they knew that I was a potential customer, but being mm -hmm. a man and being a teacher, 
it's, <laughs> it's weird. You teach at school during the day. And, you know, I went to the karaoke bar at seven, which is weird, which is strange. And I came back right. at midnight. But other customer came to the karaoke bar at midnight and I left the, the bar at midnight. That's weird. Because, you know, I, I don't want to, to go to school and, and, and was late for school. You know, and everyone, everyone knew that I was a teacher. No one cares I was a PhD student. They knew that I was a teacher. So being, being a man was not, was not an obstacle. Maybe it, it could, that could have been. But being a teacher is a big problem for me. You know, and imagine on, on the other way around, if I was female, it was even more difficult to gather some kind, this kind of information. Mm -hmm. So gen gender matter. That's why I said posi positionality matters. Mm -hmm. Class, mm -hmm. gender, yeah, ethnicity, linguist, uh, you know, language mm -hmm. you speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, we have another question um, from Kun Ruani Tupas. Please excuse my pronunciation if I'm wrong. Um, thank you very much for the fascinating talk. I wonder about the impact of your research findings on the communities or the people you worked with, or perhaps the impact on policy, etc. Um, actually, this um, the talk today. It was not really my research. It was just one one observation of, of my main research, but there was but um, there was no impact. But most of the information was written in this book on the left hand side, which is not at all about the language, but it's about border crossing in everyday lives. And people do not resort to um, official immigration checkpoint. They just cross the border. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't mean that they are not border. Sometimes, if the government say that we will, we will detect the border crossing, they just out of the blue go and collect people who cross the border illegally. We, we never know. We have to be, be local and know the officers and use, sometimes I would argue the interpersonal relationship between the villagers and, and the local officers help significantly for, for the border crossing to be successful. And, and why this matters? It matters because Thai Lao border is when it's, it's the river, it, it is 1,108 kilometers long. And this happens along the way. You just cross the border to visit friends, to drink whiskey. Still, even in COVID time, I have, since the, the, the pandemic of COVID-19, I have never been back to the field. But I believe people do cross still, even though with COVID. And, but there's no effect on the government yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. I have a um, final question. Um, so since we focus on language, right? And, uh, you know, we struggle to communicate. We think we say the right thing to, to, to make people feel good and, and feel like, you know, uh, talking back to us, right? But did you have um, any, um, challenges or experiences in, well, you know, whatever you said that you meant so well, you know, was taken, you know, wrongly or, you know, um, things that you said that, you know, it would be okay, but then they, they didn't receive it, you know, very uh, positively, kind of miscommunication um, at all. This one, the change of accent. <laughs> if, I could, could turn, could, if I could turn the clock back, I wouldn't try to be like, yeah speak like mm -hmm. them. Sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I could speak like them, but not like them 100%. Maybe some 1% is wrong and they could sense mm -hmm. it. And that is wrong. Yeah. If you, you are wrong, 1% one, 1 is 100%. You know, like, mm -hmm. like when we go to Bangkok and people who try to speak Isan and it's not 100% correct, we still uh -huh. think it's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so in this case, being perfect is not a good thing. <laughs> Be yourself. <laughs> okay, very good. Now we are pushing to the final final moments. Um, yes. Would you like to kind of make a, give our final remarks or thoughts um, 
on the presentation, on the research or whatever? Yeah, I, I would like to, if I have inspiration, I would make this kind of the, uh, research project, but still I don't at the moment. And it's just a big, no, it's just a small observation from, from another research. I, yeah, I hope I have more inspiration. So Ajahn Alexander, could you give me like <laughs> in the future to, to bring this to, to be bigger in terms of academic, that would be, would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm humble, you know, but you know what? Um, I think language is very important. I, and, uh, you know, sometimes it can be an obstacle to our understanding of what people think and, and how they behave. Um, trying to be like them, it doesn't always work. And uh, so, you know, like I study, you know, sensitive uh, issues and, and so, you know, there's no way that I can study or interview a certain group of people, even though I speak the same language. So sometimes, you know, uh, being imperfect, being, you know, from, you know, outside of Thailand can help you to get some perspectives because people are not restrained by uh, suspicion or, you know, um, knowing um, or guessing your intention and, and, and taking your your intention in the in the wrong way. So I think there are limitations, and there are also you know positive things about you know uh, being able to use a, a language of the people who we would like to uh, study. But but I want to make this point, and I think you agree with me that if you want to study, um, it, it's 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 good not to have to have uh, not to have an interpreter or translator when we do a few research, right? Because, you know, our own interpretation can be, you know, as much of an obstacle in itself sometimes because we have our background. I don't know. Do you agree with that? Oh, I don't need interpretation. I don't think I, we do need right. it. I have to, right. to engage right. ourselves. Yeah, it's very, very important. But again, we have our own limitations too, right? As a researcher coming from a different class, from a different gender. But, 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 but indeed, being a teacher, being a teacher is very, really, is really work. It, it does work in Southeast Asia con context. Being a teacher mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. helps. And yeah. there also one time that being a teacher helped me. But maybe we have mm -hmm. to talk in the next presentation. Yeah, that's very yes. interesting. But but that is perceivable, right? Because we yes. look up to teachers, we see teachers yes. as role models in, in a lot of communities. So, and, I and allow, what you would like. Yeah. yeah, yes. Very good. Now, I think we have about a few minutes. I'm checking my QA box. No open questions. And uh, so I think we are ready to uh, bring this talk to um, an end. And so um, thank you it's very fine. much, Dr. <laughs> Mr. You're welcome, <laughs> it's my honor. Yeah, so I'm gonna read this. Uh, so the next talk will be on May, to, uh, May uh, 12th. Uh, the title is Re-examining the Operation of Hate Speech in Thailand, the Case of Buddhists and Muslims. Very interesting, Dr. Anwar Koma. So, uh, mark your calendar for that. And for today, thank you so much, Dr. Tanatit. And uh, I hope you continue to work with us and produce interesting research work for all of us um, as a great contribution to Thai studies. Thank you very much, everybody in the audience as well, and for your questions and comments. I'll see you next time on the TS4 seminar series. Thank you. 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 Thank you.